I started my opening and I start the reply with Christian Institute and that line of cases. I know that Mr. Piesky's name appears on the QC's list. My Lord, it does. I've tried unsuccessfully to persuade him to come and show that physically. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, well, obviously that's very good news. Thank you, Mr. Piesky. Well, well done. I'm very grateful. I'm sure he will be too. Christian Institute. I was going to start with that and that line of case law, if I may. And I started with that in opening because this is an attack on the statute. It's an attack on the primary legislation, and indeed the scheme under it, but on the primary legislation as a key and integral part of that. And a Section 4 declaration has been made affecting the primary legislation. But the first question, before you get anywhere near a remedy issue, is whether or not the legislation is itself incompatible. That's a necessary precondition to the making of a Section 4 declaration. And so, the first point to note about Christian Institute, BB and that line of cases is that they're not cases just about remedy, about how you exercise the discretion under Section 4 of the Human Rights Act, whether or not to make a declaration. They go to that prior and necessary question of incompatibility of the legislation. They focus on whether it is the legislation that can be said to be disproportionate and unjustified, and it is a principle test that the courts, the Supreme Courts, uh, the Supreme Court has developed in that context, that focuses on whether it is truly the legislation that is to be declared incompatible, or, or whether individual cases under it are the problem, effectively. That's the issue, but it goes not just to remedy, but to incompatibility. Do, do you accept in practice, uh, do you accept that if, if the statute uh, in practice uh, is uh, disproportionate, unjustified, incompatible, um, uh, that's sufficient. Well, so you've got to look at the operation of it. My Lord, the difficulty with that is separating out, uh, well, I'll come to address the question of time at which you judge justification. My submission is that you judge the legislation as a piece of legislation. Um, well, on, on day one? On day one. Uh, 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 and it can't drift in and out of compatibility is going to be the submission. But the reason for emphasising Christian Institute and BB is because they provide a practical answer to the question my Lord has posed. You've got to be able to say at any point in time that all or almost all cases under the legislation will be incompatible. So there's a degree of inherency within the legislation. So uh, I'm fully prepared to accept that one can have a look at how the legislation operates in practice. And I'll come to make more detailed submissions about that. But what you ultimately have to conclude is that the legislation itself is incompatible. How do you do that? What is the principal test by which you do that? What degree of risk or inherency has to be demonstrated? Answer, that was the issue of principle that was considered in Christian Institute and BB, and to which they provided a clear answer. But if it is, if it is inherent in a legislative measure uh, that discrimination may arise, and in point of fact, that is exactly what has happened to a significant extent. I'm using the words if, right? But if that is so, then why, then, why then is the legislation not incompatible? Well, then the legislation will meet the Christian Institute test. But isn't that then this case on the, on the uh, respondent's argument? My Lord, it isn't, for reasons which I will come to in a moment. But at the moment, I'm just seeking to establish the test. And the test is the test set out in Christian Institute and Beebe, which is whether or not the legislation is capable as a piece of legislation of being complied with and being operated compatibly. And that involves asking whether in all or almost all cases there will be incompatibility. If that is so, well, the test is met. But the prior question is, what is the test? And my submission is that the test is exactly the one set out in Christian Institute and BB. And there's no reason we submit why that doesn't apply to Article 8 and Article 14 together. 
uh, there's no suggestion of some different principle to be applied because here you're dealing with alleged discrimination. And B, B, and D was both. And it held that Article 14 added nothing. In any event, that certainly should be the test when you're not dealing with a situation in which it is said uh, that the legislation itself discriminates directly or that the legislation itself <coughs> uh, creates indirect discrimination. But the allegation is rather that because of perfectly sensible looking ex facie compatible legislation, uh, there is a risk uh, that private individuals will discriminate in practice. Uh, and it, in my submission, that is exactly the situation in principle that was being considered in the context of Article 8 and 14 in BB and in the context of Article 8 in Christian Institute. Would you accept, Sir James, it doesn't have to be, or doesn't always have to be, the entire legislative scheme which satisfies the test? It can be enough if it's a significant part of it, which one can't always, one can't in practice sensibly dissociate from the rest. Yes, you can challenge individual parts of an act. Yes. You don't have to say, it's no part of this submission to say that you need to be able to say that the entire act in all its provisions yeah. is incompatible. You can zoom in on a particular section. Okay. Yes, that's what I thought. Yes. Yeah. No, no. This act is concerned with many other things. Yes. Of course. And, and no, one, no one says that you, in order to get a declaration of incompatibility about a single provision, yeah. you have to demonstrate that all of the provisions. Yeah. Yeah. That's not the all or almost all cases that is being referred to. The all or all, almost all cases that is being referred to. By is, reference to that. Exactly so. There are questions later on under remedy about whether or not the judge in any event over declared. Yeah. But you can have a single provision. But the test in relation to the <coughs> single provision is whether it will lead to discrimination in almost all, all, almost yeah, all cases. That's whether it was treated by the cases about gay marriage and, or same-sex marriage and so forth. It, exactly so. But uh, as I said, I make it absolutely clear it's no part of my case. So if the individual measure which is being challenged yeah. will have a discriminatory effect in a significant number of cases, but not, quote, almost all, close quotes, cases, you say that's not enough? I do. That, that's the significance of the capability of the legislation to react properly. So then uh, the, <coughs> significant, the significant number of aggrieved punters are left to their hugely valuable remedy in the county court. Is that what it comes to? I mean, it, it, it's a nebulous remedy. My Lord, it isn't a nebulous remedy for reasons I will come to. Well, that's what the submission is. And they have to pay, uh, a point is made which I, I that's what the picks on is it's not a tribunal remedy where you are not at risk as to costs. It's a court remedy where you are at risk as to costs. Which is the which is the which is the entire scheme of the Equality Act two thousand and ten. Absolutely, but it is. You say well that's the measure Parliament seemed fit to provide. That's exactly what I say. But at the moment I'm on the prior point. You are there, is, there is a debate between the parties <coughs> about what is the correct approach in principle. My submission in opening, as you will recall, is that you take it could be a single piece. <coughs> a single section in an act, yes. and you ask the question posed in Christian Institute, and on the evidence we get nowhere near it. Does it get, lead to discrimination in all, almost all cases? No, it doesn't, because the height of the evidence is 25% or 40% or whatever it may be. So, sorry for shooting these points here, but uh, Not uh, at all. Frankly, I think I may have been a bit, bit, perhaps a bit tough in my questioning of Ms. Kaufman and Mr. Bates on this, and um, thinking to think, this is not a milk run, as far as you're concerned. I'm, I'm, I'm not suggesting it is. No, but, uh, my my no, task no, in reply will be to I, I bring you back I, to the true I, path. I just, <laughs> I, I, I just think I perhaps gave Mr. Bates a, a harder time than, than his excellent response. Uh, my made, submission will be that uh, you should have given made me think. My, submissions will, my submission will be that you should have given him a harder time in his <laughs> short submissions. Yeah, but well, I think, I'll yeah. come to that in due course if I may. The test, however, and the issue of principle between the parties. You said that. The crucial starting point on your submission is the, the BB approach. The BB the and the Christian Institute, Institute approach. approach. And the issue of principle yeah. says, is it all or almost all cases in I relation to a single statute revision, if you will, uh, or, or is it something looser than that? And what is said is that in some way the case law, they don't say it doesn't work in Article 14 cases. Yeah. It does, and it plainly does in a situation like this where ex facie it's fine and you've got a risk of cases where private landlords may discriminate against private individuals who are applying for tenancies. So that's exactly the same situation as was considered under Article 8 and 14 and BB and 8 in the Christian Institute. What is said is that the case law 
uh, establishing that test is merely about inherency and that the test laid down in Christian Institute, if I understood the submission correctly, has in some way, shape or form been overturned or superseded. And my short answer to that is that it plainly has not been watered down, nor have those words, the critical words, have been altered. There was a unanimous judgment in Christian Institute, as you will recall. There was a unanimous judgment in Beebe, on which uh, Christian Institute was based. In both cases, that test was formulated in the way it was obviously very carefully, and, note, was actually dispositive. The way in which the case th th that principle was formulated was dispositive in both of those cases, because in both of those cases there was strong evidence that quite a large number of people were almost certain to be subject to disproportionate interference under Article 8 or discriminated against. So the, the way in which that all or almost test was formulated was actually dispositive in those two unanimous Supreme Court uh, judgments. And none of the cases... It's authorities tab 26, I think. I started, as you recall, with paragraph two, paragraph two yeah. and then I went on to the, to the statements which were relied upon principally in the Christian Institute judgment, expressing the principle in exactly the same way, and they were uh, paragraph 60. Bear in mind, in this case, the dispute about the remedy and what the declaration should be was all to do with, or all flowed from the fact that all members of the court were pretty confident that there would be a significant number of people out there who wouldn't be able to access the facilities necessary to educate themselves about the English language because they lived in remote rural areas or they didn't have the money to pay for tuition course or whatever. But nevertheless, not enough. Paragraph 60 was relied on Christian Institute, as you recall, and so was paragraph 69 in the judgment of Lord Hodge. I'm sorry to repeat paragraphs that I referred to in opening, but those were the key ones. And, and you would also, I suppose, observe that Phoebe was a case which involved a, a background of ethnicity and nationality. Exactly. One of the suspect, One of the suspect uh, uh, categories. attributes. Yeah. But the key feature of it is that this was a case in which the court was entirely satisfied that there would be a significant number of cases where there would be a disproportionate interference with Article 8 rights because people couldn't get access to the relevant facilities for the purpose of educating themselves and so on. And then in Christian Institute, if you just flick forward... So just, just, just before sorry, we leave BB, yeah. can, can you just remind me, uh, to James, of the provision, um, the type of provision uh, that was the focus of BB? It was an immigration rule. It was. Yeah. It was. Yes, thank you. And then if you recall, in Christian Institute, I relied upon, in tab 30 of the same bundle, and again, unanimous... Uh, Supreme uh, Court. Uh, uh, you'll recall that the key paragraph for that purpose was paragraph 88 behind tab 30. This, this isn't uh, reported in one of the... It doesn't seem to be, rather oddly. I don't it's recall the... myself having looked at this for this case. The Christian Institute case. Oh, yeah, yeah. And it's been quite frequently cited and relied upon, but it's odd that it's not. I, I don't think it's in the main law reports, oddly, it isn't, right? either in the weeklies or in the right. appeal cases. I can say that with some confidence, because I did, do remember checking on Westlaw to see whether there was a better version of it. No, that, 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 no, 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 it's just, just a... Okay. Apologies for that, right. but it's paragraph 88. Yeah. You, uh, paragraph 88 is the paragraph, really. 
Yes. That, that you rely on. I mean, I know it refers back to BB, but it does. it's paragraph 88. It's paragraph 88, and you'll remember I took you also to 94, Act four. Act four, yeah. 96, yeah. which were the same, it was capable of necessarily and all of that. Yes. So I was on the question whether it's been watered down by subsequent case law. My submission is that it hasn't. Do you remember you were handed loose MM Lebanon, yeah. which, as you'll recall, was one of the matters, one of the cases relied upon, I think, by Lord Hodge in Paragraph 69 of BB. But if you just take that up again, if you would. And just go back to Paragraph 56 of MM, if you have that still loose. M.M. Yeah. Power 56. And just look at the, end, <laughs> the second half of Power 56. And this, <coughs> you will recall, was a seven person Supreme Court. So it's para 69 of BB that's being cited that re is relied upon as setting out the relevant principle. <coughs> and there's no answer to say that this, this is about the inherency of that, or inherency of some kind, because this language, now repeated by a unanimous five judge court, a unanimous five judge court, and now a unanimous seven judge court, this language provides the clear and carefully thought out and binding test of inherency. This is how you determine whether incompatibility is inherent in <coughs> legislation, particularly in the context of primary, <coughs> primary legislation. And again, MM was, a, was an immigration rule. So you've got both species of, I mean, we know the debates around what the true status of immigration rules are, but akin to secondary. <coughs> I mean, it, you, you, you say it doesn't matter because the test is the test, but I mean, here we've got prime legislation. We have. So it's a for sure right then. But that was also the position in Christian Institute. Yes. And here the short submission is, and it goes, I emphasise again, to compatibility, not just the remedy and remedial discretion under Section 4, plainly not met on any view of the evidence. At its height, the evidence demonstrates that some landlords might prefer a British passport, and that doesn't meet the standard. My learning friend says, well, it's inherent in the Act, and points to me saying, well, there are, what else could Parliament do? Um, uh, but I don't accept that either, even if that was the test, which it isn't, because the test of inherency is all or almost all cases. Um, but the 2014 Act does not require and does not authorise discrimination of the kind complained about. On the contrary, discrimination, both direct and indirect, is unlawful under the Equalities Act 2010. And if landlords are preferring or operating a practice to prefer British passports, which is the nub of the allegation of discrimination made by the claimants, that is unlawful. Not terribly attractive that one can have a, a statute on the books which, in a very significant number of cases, <coughs> will lead to discrimination. I'm talking generally, but it's not very attractive, is it? Well, can I come to that question? Because that, that goes to the submission which is being made that the Act incentivises that does, state yes, of affairs. Yes. That's the way the case is put against me. Or yes. put another way, is that... I think the word incentivise was the word used, It actually. was. But, but one can put the same point in a different way, which is the, word, the wording used by the judge. Is this a rational, logical or understandable response by landlords? That asks the same question. Now... So far as that is concerned, if I can turn directly to that with the prompt from my lord in the chair, my learned friend Miss Kaufman accepts that if the discrimination of the kind she asserts is taking place through a preference by landlords, practice by landlords to prefer British passports, and that is the foundation of her case, then they are acting unlawfully. 
and she says that's unjustified on their part. But, she says, it's nevertheless a rational, uh, logical response to the incentivizing act. And my submission is that that, precisely that, is the flawed foundation on which this case proceeds. It only incentivizes, in any true sense, if the view is that the decision by landlords to adopt discriminatory and asserted to be discriminatory practices is acceptable. And many of the arguments, as we'll see as we go through this reply, many of the arguments I submit lead either directly or at one remove back to this point. And this point is at the very heart of this case. And my answers to that incentivizing point are, 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 are as follows. Three particular answers, if I may, to that. Firstly, it is a complete answer we submit to that case, that there is nothing rational or logical about that position. Landlords cannot act in a manner accepted and asserted to be unlawful. Private citizens well, must... Would you agree, uh, the point that Mr Bates made, you can't equate this response with the landlord who simply does not put in smoke alarms because he can't be prepared to spend the money or the bother. It's not the same thing, is it? My submission is at base, it's exactly the same thing, because both of them depend upon the landlord acting unlawfully. So they're not, they're not, the landlord who doesn't put the smoke alarms deliberately doesn't put in the smoke alarms, but in these cases we're not hypothesising landlords who are deliberately discriminating. We're hypothesising a situation necessarily in which the landlords have properly informed themselves about the legislation, as is the duty of any citizen. And then have seen the code, brackets, everyone accepts that if you comply with the code you will not discriminate, and then decides not to do so, and to operate a practice of preparing British passports. I'll come back to the question as, as to how the RLA put that, put that submission, that you had, a, you had, as it were, sector discrimination, but that didn't mean you had individual discrimination. I'm going to come back to that submission in a moment. But for present purposes, my first answer to this incentivizing, it's rational, it's logical, it's understandable uh, point, however it's put, is that you can't act in that way. Private citizens have got to understand and obey the law. Whatever the economic incentives, whatever the practical incentives not to do so. And as I said in opening, if the premise for the argument is that it is the legislative scheme that is causing discrimination, then you can't say, and is incentivizing the landlord, persuading the landlords into this, you can't say, well, we the landlords know about one bit, fail to inform ourselves about the rest of it, including the proper ways set out in the code of operating non discriminatory practices. And so my learned friend says, well, that, that, that's the way they do it in fact. In fact, they operate in that way. Well, even if that's correct, my answer is it's not acceptable. It's not a proper basis for asserting that an act of parliament is incompatible as discriminatory. You can't found that on an action which is itself unlawful. Put the same point rather more broadly. I don't want to be pompous about this, but, but the law provides no incentive to disregard itself. There is no legally recognised or recognisable risk that a person will break the law. And in none of the cases that you've been taken to, in Strasbourg or in England, in none of those cases was the very action said to make the act incompatible as discriminatory positively prohibited by law. So that's the first answer, a principle. I just say that last point again. In none of the cases was the very action said to make the act incompatible, brackets here operating the practices of preferring British passports, incompatible, uh, uh, was that positively prohibited by law, which is the position here. So the foundation of this claim... Yes, Yes. Well, that's the first answer. I'm not going to labour it. It's, it's there. It's about, it's about the rule of law. Secondly, in any event, the alternatives 
presented by Miss Kaufman were not, we respectfully submit, presented in a proper uh, uh, or fair way in her argument. I don't mean propriety in, that, in, the, in the strict sense, but were not presented in a, in a fair way in her argument. But the presentation was of an, a high or obvious risk of penalty or crime versus no real risk of action if you discriminate. And the first point we make on the, on the left-hand side of that particular balanced equation is that there is no such high risk. And that is because the scheme, pursuant to the primary legislation that required it, provides clear rules. It lists the documents. It sets out the reasonable steps that need to be taken to check including in relation to what you have to do in the, on the documents, what you have to do by way of retention, what you have to do in relation to lodgers, and it sets them out in the code. It isn't difficult. There's nothing approaching an absolute ob ob obligation. And everyone accepts that if you simply follow the code, you don't discriminate. There's no excuse for not informing yourself about what those requirements, what those details are and what you can or should do to comply. And if you do that, there's no real risk at all. And nor is it accepted that the risk might be made out simply because there may be certain circumstances in which you have to take possession proceedings, which was the point made by the RLA yesterday. But you follow the rules. That's the straightforward way of avoiding any risk of prosecution or penalty. So that's the left. That's really, a, that's really a link to your first point, isn't it? It's linked to the first point, but it, it, it goes to the left-hand side of that equation, right. because I'm on here that whether there, there was a fair presentation. On the other side is the point that I know my lord was concerned about, which is the real risk of county court action. How does that work? Is there, it, 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 is there is a that, state measure which gives that an effective penalty? Yeah. And the principled answer that I give to that is the same one the mechanism of enforcement of the legal obligation which plainly exists not to discriminate does not render it rational or logical to disobey the law. They are obliged to obey the law. And it can't be said, and isn't said, as it would have to be for this point to have any legs, that the scheme of enforcement under the EA 2010 generally, and it's a general attack on the EA and its enforcement mechanisms, renders it its protection practical or illusory. That case isn't mounted. Instead, a prepared to wound but afraid to strike case is mounted, which rather suggests that it's all a bit difficult and that the scheme is inappropriate and that landlords can break the law accordingly. I, I, I see the forces of the point I'm making James. On the other hand, we have to imagine ourselves in real-world situations as well. Looking at it in that way, it's difficult not to feel some sympathy with people who are perhaps thinking about letting off, letting off a room in their house on an informal basis for, um, for somebody in return for a small payment. And they just say to themselves, well, we know there's all this legislation, but in practical terms, the simplest thing is going to be to just take the first person who comes along with an easily verifiable primary document such as a British passport, or maybe some other easily recognisable passport or identity card. And I don't for a moment wish to discriminate against anybody else, I just want to have an easy life, not to run any risk at all of exposing myself to all these penalties laid down in the scheme. Um, and if it, if it seems it, in practical terms a hard thing to say that that is acting unlawfully, you know, sort of morally obnoxious, or even legally obnoxious. <laughs> well, one needs to be a little careful with that example. And I fully appreciate that I think that was the way it was put by the RLA, yes. that you do it, you do it, it's first person to prove. It was said to be a kind of neutral approach, which might lead to indirect discrimination in practice, but was miles away from the intention of the person in question. Yes, but by doing that, first person to prove. Everyone accepts, yeah. including, I think, the RLA, which is why there's a, there's a, a, a degree of casuistry about that movement of the goalpost to say it's the first person who proves. But everyone accepts that a practice of landlords of preferring British passports would be unlawful as discriminatory. Indeed, that's the very foundation of the discrimination case which the claimant mounts. Yes. 
So what the RLA have to do, which is why I describe, I hope not impertinently, the submission as involving a degree of casuistry, is to slightly shift the goalposts and to do exactly what my Lord has just put to me, which is to say it's first person to prove. Yeah. Well, if you had first person to prove, no doubt that would be much less objectionable, if objectionable at all, because you could turn up with one of the documents from the list of documents and say, here I am, I'm first through the landlord's door, and I happen to have a biometric residence card. Well, that's fine, because that involves introducing a practice that says it's first proof. It doesn't discriminate. But that isn't the case for discrimination that's mounted at all. Yeah. That involves some different practice, which is why it was all jolly convenient for the RLA to put it on that basis. Because if they put it on the basis of the actual discrimination case which is mounted, which is that their members are in fact operating a different policy or practice, which is to prefer British passports, then everyone accepts, and Miss Kaufman positively asserts, and we agree, would amount to unlawful discrimination. So you can't, you, you can't, as it were, alter the practice or policy and then say, well, that one's fine. It may well be, but that isn't the discrimination case which is mounted. And if you actually focus on the discrimination case which is mounted, which is landlords prefer British passports, and that has within it the seeds of discrimination, then that is... Uh, uh, that, that is a wholly uh, different matter. I strongly suspect, I can't know, that in cases of lodges and Airbnb and things like this, uh, people doing it aren't seeking any documents at all. Well, then, then you go in back which, to... In case of which case, yeah, then the, you point go... falls, the point falls away. So, yeah. right. uh, it's the, the, the real, in the real world, someone who's letting someone lodge for payment for two weeks yeah. One does wonder whether such a person is even in trouble to get any documents. Well, maybe they will, maybe they will, maybe they won't. But the only assumption on the only premise... They probably don't even know no. the existence of this scheme. Well, and if they, they don't, they don't. But then, then, yeah. then the premise the on which... The agents obviously will. And of course. And have training, of course. Of course. And the premise on which this court operates, as it does in the criminal law and in every other area of the law, is that, that, that those citizens who are bound by a particular law... Uh, have the obliga obligation to inform themselves about it. Yeah. And, and so if that's the premise, all you have to do is comply with the law, and if you choose not to do that on that premise, and you do the thing which is said to amount to discrimination, which is to prefer British passports, and not the thing when the RLA have shifted the goalposts a bit to make their case a bit more acceptable, then you end up with clear discrimination and a clear ability to go... Uh, to uh, 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 the county court, if necessary. Yeah. And can I just pick up one point, or, or, or two other points, before I move to the, my third submission on this, but the two other points are, can you just go back to the code on which both uh, the RLA and the claimants relied in, uh, uh, in their submissions? It's in the supplemental bundle of 182M, The reason for going back to this, it's the penultimate paragraph on the page, the one just above the shaded box on 182M for mummy. You'll remember you were taken to this twice, once by Miss Cowson and once by the RLA. <laughs> and the submission appeared to be, or the suggestion appeared to be, that here we've got the government themselves in their code recognising that there are all sorts of business incentives to act in a discriminatory manner, was the implication. And that's principally hung on the introductory words to the second sentence. But I do just invite you to read that paragraph in its entirety to see what it's actually about. It doesn't do anything of the kind. <coughs> what this is about, this paragraph, is a particular situation in which the person is not able to produce acceptable documents. It's simply dealing with a case where no documents are produced and then saying, well, you don't, you don't have to, but you should keep the tenancy open if possible. It is in no sense an acknowledgement that there will be a business justification for plainly discriminatory behaviour. <coughs> 
was just to come to the come come back to the point about the efficacy and effectiveness of the scheme under the the enforcement mechanisms and the scheme under the Equalities Act 2010. Well, my principal answer is I think the one that I gave to my uh, Lord Lord Justice Davis a minute ago, which is that is the enforcement mechanism that Parliament has chosen to set up across the sphere yeah. of enforcement, and no one is having a go at that, and nor could they. Well, you said that's preeminently a matter which... Uh, preeminently a matter for Parliament. Left, left, left for the uh, exactly. domestic legislature. And, and frankly, irrespective of the nature of the, of, of the enforcement mechanism, I would still say as my principal principled answer, principal principled answer, that a citizen is obliged to obey the law irrespective. But the enforcement mechanisms are the ones set up by uh, one set up by Parliament. But we do invite you to note um, that uh, uh, a, if you've got a case of uh, clear unlawful discrimination, uh, 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 when you correctly analyse it, as, uh, uh, as I've, I submit I've just done. That you've got a clear case of discrimination, there is the availability of a cause of action and that's enough. But we also do note, particularly given the thrust of Mr Armstrong's submissions, that there are, for EHRC, that there are provisions in the equalities legislation which provide EHRC themselves with various powers, including to support such litigation. If they're concerned, for example, about discrimination being rife in a sector or concerned that no such cases are coming forward, you should have on your desk uh, a, a three particular documents. I hope they were put up this morning. Well, I know they were because I saw them being put up there. The first one looks like, is the Immigration Act 1971. It's that. Yeah. And I invite you to take up that little clip. Oh, yes. So they're slightly out of order. But for this purpose, the one I want to go to is the Equality Act 2006 which is the second of the documents. And I wanted to do so to in invite you to note the powers that there are in the EHRC, which it might be thought were legislated for by Parliament precisely to support the sort of difficulties that, that might exist of individual people going off to go and get county court actions and all the difficulties that my little friend Mr Armstrong spent so long um, uh, telling me about. We didn't spend longer than 20 minutes. <laughs> 20 minutes. Um, so. With the QCs would be as concise. Section 20, if you would. Yes. <coughs> a power to investigate whether yes. a person has committed an unlawful act. Yes. Section 21 a power to give that person a notice requiring them to take action. At section 16, a power to conduct an inquiry so as to further equality and diversity, eliminate discrimination and promote human rights. And that of course can be sectoral, in other words if there's a gender pay gap in employment for example, or specific, the Labour Party. So they could if they wanted conduct an evaluation or an inquiry into the right to rent scheme to see if it was causing widespread race discrimination, to see if landlords could be assisted to comply with the law. Section 28. A power to provide assistance to litigants bringing discrimination claims. Section 30. A power to intervene in proceedings and section 24, a power to seek injunctions. Now those provisions, it might be thought, are on the statute book precisely to acknowledge the sort of difficulties with individuals being expected to go off and prove discrimination claims in the county court. I mean, there are a variety of things that assist them in doing that, reverse burdens of proof and so on under the Equalities Act. But these are broader powers given to a specific government body designed to bolster the proper enforcement of discrimination law in the United Kingdom. And you'll bear in mind, if we're talking about ramping up the penalties for discrimination, I should say at the outset, we rather agree with Lord Justice Higginbottom, who put to my learned friend, isn't your case really all about ramping up that side of the equation rather than the other? <laughs> 
and we respectfully agree it probably is, but my answer to that is the one I've given. Um, Parliament has legislated for a scheme of enforcement. Uh, it's always been civil. I don't think there are any criminal penalties for discrimination, but it's always been a civil scheme. How do you enforce a civil scheme? Normal answer to that is you provide access to the courts for the purpose of bringing a cause of action. Well, that might be difficult, see all the submissions that you've received, so they pass these supportive provisions providing the independent and expert body with the ability to assist in that endeavour. So we do not accept that that high risk of penalty versus nothing doing in the county court is a true and fair reflection of the way the legislative scheme actually works. That's the second answer. The third answer... I'm sorry, I'm sorry to interrupt. Lord, I'm sorry. Could I just take one step back? I didn't want to interrupt your flow. Just the, 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 the paragraph uh, to which you referred in the code uh, which um, uh, focuses on individuals without documents. I understand your submissions in relation to documents. Uh, you say um, uh, landlords should comply with the code, look at the documents, if they comply, uh, that, that's that. Um, in, in relation to those without documents, the, the, there will be a delay, won't there? Uh, whereas if somebody just presents the right documents, uh, yeah. they can be accepted as a tenant. Uh, that's that. Those without documents will probably need a check. Uh, the um, evidence, or at least the submissions, which have force, um, say that those people are likely to be particularly vulnerable uh, because they will be the victim of trafficking or, or some other group. Uh, but what, what do you say about discrimination in, 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 in respect of that group of, of, of individuals? Well, there may, be, there may be some delay, I acknowledge that. Almost all people will have a document of some kind uh, which illustrates the right to remain that sits on one of the lists that, that are referred the, to. The vast, the vast majority will. The vast majority the, will. The, 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 there will be a substantial group in terms of numbers um, of people who will not. Well, then, then the most that can be done is to set up the checking service to provide a tight time table within which those uh, issues are turned round and... Uh, you have to set up some practical system to enable that but, to be checked. But, but do you say that a, a landlord, um, get the terminology right, um, would or might be acting uh, rationally and lawfully uh, by uh, accepting, as it were, first past the post in terms of proof of documents, uh, as opposed to these individuals who, 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 who won't be first because of the, in, in, the inherent delay in the checking system? Well, my Lord, I can see a perfectly sensible argument that they would be acting lawfully in that, in that circumstance. And so there is that, that, there is that wrinkle, but this is ultimately a scheme which depends upon the provision of documents for entirely understandable reasons, because that's the primary mechanism of checking. And if for whatever reason you don't have documents, what is the state to do? Answer, provide a service with a tight turnaround and default provisions and all the rest of it which will enable a landlord to do it and then put in the code something along the lines that we've just seen. And I think that paragraph does indicate that in relation to that small category, uh, there is the possibility of doing something else, but they're encouraged to do the holding open thing whilst that process is ongoing. I'll speak for myself, um, I, I will be quite interested to see what the note, which I know is going to be provided to us in due course, tells us about what the ultimate default position is for people who simply cannot produce documents. Yeah, well the, ultimate, the first ultimate default position is going to be by, is going to be the two days what I meant by the default position was the two days that, after. But, uh, uh, but I, no, speak, but where, where do they go? Well, yes, no, I've got that. I understand what you want in the note. We'll, we'll, we'll wait yeah. I'm sorry, but just, just, to, to, just to nail that down. Mm. So, uh, the, there may not be discrimination by the landlords in those circumstances. There may not. I mean, we're talking reasonably hypothetically. But what about the scheme? Do you say that the scheme is not discriminatory simply because of this small, in, in, in proportion terms, uh, relatively small group of people um, who, who may be discriminated against in terms of getting accommodation? They may be treated differently. I think the way in which Sorry, that... Treated differently. The way in which I would put that, I think, is that, that that, as a part of the overall scheme, is a justifiable difference. Because the scheme goes out of its way to try to do that quickly and to encourage landlords to behave in the right way. But I can see a much more interesting argument about whether or not that would be discriminatory and whether it, if you operated the sort of practice we were discussing a minute ago, that itself contains within it the seeds of its own discriminatory destruction. 
Yes. The third answer I was going to give was the logic of their approach would mean that the legislature really could not do it. And it's no doubt attractive to say, as both Ms Kaufman and uh, Mr Westgate did, well, we don't know until we see a different scheme, it's all for the government. Well, of course it is. But the logic of their argument, which is the point that was being put to both of them, flows from the fact that the scheme creates, on her case, an incentive to disobey the law uh, and to discriminate. It's nothing more sophisticated than that, and there will therefore be a whole bunch of parallel schemes in which that might cause problems, but it also renders it very difficult to see what the alternative is. And the only alternative that was uh, come up with um, uh, 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 was, in effect, to say, well, the way in which it should be set up is by having a single criminal offence, uh, and that was uh, debated. And my answers in relation to that, the criminal offence line of argument, uh, are firstly that a criminal offence, even of the kind that my learned friend advocated, still incentivises landlords. It might be thought just as much that the criminal offence is there, so it isn't any answer. But it's also, secondly, absurd, we submit, to posit a landlord who's not engaging with the code and legal responsibilities on discrimination, but is subtle enough to be drawing and basing their action upon fine mens rea distinctions, reasonable excuse, recklessness and all the rest of it. Uh, the third point is that you could not have a scheme of guidance <coughs> without checks on that case, even though... If, in other words, if you just had a criminal offence and that was it, you couldn't have a scheme of guidance for that about checks, even though you would need them if the offence was intentional or reckless, to take it to its highest. You'd still need a scheme of guidance and you couldn't have it, on her case, because it would be incentivising discrimination. And even though not having that guidance would indeed leave landlords having to know about the complexities of immigration law. And it's problematic, fourthly, for a different reason, which flows from the directive. And uh, that's the reason for giving you the little clip of the first little clip of documents headed Immigration Act 1971. Just to explain what the position, uh, uh, what the position is. And the, no, uh, this is still in force. No. no it's, it's I'm gonna, I'm gonna, yes, I'm going to take you through it. Uh, this first page, Immigration Act 1971, Section 25, is the Immigration Act 1971 at, in its original form. Right? So you see the two offences that are created in sub 1 and sub 2. <coughs> one involved helping people to enter the UK knowingly concerned in making or carrying out arrangements and so on, entry into the UK at sub one, and a harbouring offence, knowingly harbouring 25-2. We then get the directive, which you have behind, so that's the original form of section 25. We then get the directive, which you have behind tab five in bundle one of the authorities. Can we just go back to that very briefly? You don't need any reminding about Article 1, Sub 1B, because lots of references have been made to it. But can I also invite you to note Article 2, which covers inter alia accomplices and attempts. My Lord, sorry, I'm ahead of you. Under 1, Tab 5. Yep. And I was saying you're well aware of 1, 1B, and I'm inviting you to have a look at 2 covers inter alia encompasses and attempts, and Article 3 particularly, which obliges states to take measures necessary to ensure that the infringements are subject to effective, proportionate and dissuasive sanctions. So dissuasive is the key word, perhaps, for present purposes. And they're of interest because they show <coughs> the obligation under the directive is a pretty strict one, the EU is positively keen that the state should crack down. It shows that the directive leaves the precise mechanism to the member state, as one would expect. But it is a continuing obligation. 
So if, for example, the UK does something in 2002 to deal with illegal immigration that finds by 2014 simply isn't being effective enough in preventing or dissuading people uh, from uh, that course of action, uh, then it's a continuing obligation. And that appears to be what happened, because in 2002, Parliament enacted Section 143 of the Nationality, Immigration and Asylum Act 2002, which is the second of the documents in this little clip. And I invite you just to take that up. Sorry, it's the one which has got the Immigration Act on the front of it. And you'll see from looking at the 2002 Act that what that did was to substitute a new Section 25 for the old one that you had before. And the key provision for present purposes is the new Section 25.1, which is in the form I described yesterday when I stood up during Ms. Kaplan's submissions. And, and this is still extant? This yes, is still, it's still extant. But the key point, perhaps, putting it in the framework and within the context of the directive, is that they make a new criminal offence effectively, and that just sits on its own for a bit, and then everyone sees what happens and whether that does the trick. And then Parliament, the member state for this purpose, evidently decides that that isn't doing sufficiently dissuasive things, take the language from Article 3, and they decide they need to do more, hence the 2014 Act. But that's the, that's the history of it. And so this isn't the sort of case where one can say, well, how can you have a 2014 Act implementing a directive that was passed in 2002? That's the answer. They try with the single criminal provision in a revised form to give effect in effect to 11B, and then they pass this legislation pursuant to the continuing obligation to take dissuasive action under Article 3. It was suggested in the submissions yesterday, or at least as I understood them, that the sort of, in inverted commas, minimum requirement of the directive was a criminal sanction. But that's not right, is it? I mean, the, the, the directive, as directives do, uh, simply leave the sanction to the state. It does. Um, and it leaves the sanction to the state uh, uh, alongside, the, which is what, why I took you to Article 3, which hadn't been referred to before. Uh, it leaves the sanction to the state having regard to the overarching and continu continuing obligation to take, dissuasive, to take dissuasive action. So it doesn't necessarily have to be only criminal. It can be the sort of scheme you had in the 2014 Act. But I hope that at least makes clear what the legislative well, sequence well, well, was. Well, obviously, the sanction would be a matter for the member state. It but uh, but you say that's the answer to Ms. Cowpen's objection, that uh, this scheme and legislation can operate to criminalise the merely negligent. Yeah. Which is quite a strong result. But you say that's as contemplated by the directive. As contemplated by the directive and is well within the remit of the member states operating the, those provisions. But I also say that... Well, even I would like to think it was in, uh, quotes, real world, quotes, quotes, the person who truly is merely negligent might not be allowed to prosecution. But nevertheless, we have what the statute says. We have what the statute says, and no doubt if they were truly negligent and that was all, Crown prosecutors will require people to make selections of appropriate cases and it will be reflected in penalty. Anyway, it's not quite as bad as without reasonable force of suspecting. All right. But that's the scheme that Parliament set up. I hope that sequence is at least helpful because there was some confusion about how it worked. But the 2014 Act in its civil penalty side, we respectfully submit, is also within the remit of the, uh, of the dissuasive provision in Article 3. I, I just want to just remind me, uh, that, that section 25 is in entries by the 2002 Act, that's, that's the extant provision? Yes, that's the extant provision. Still the extant provision. Exactly. I don't think that's been changed at all. But the original one was, if you see what I mean, and directly to do with the directive. The, 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 the underlying, as I understand, your underlying submission in respect of um, this third point you make, which is the logic of the approach means that this just can't be done is because whatever the sanction is, we're talking about sanctions on facilitators, landlords, whatever the sanction is, um, given the sanction, there will always be a, an incentive uh, to accept a British passport. Yeah. That's really the underlying 
a submission. It is. That was the first submission I made. I mean, whatever, whatever the sanction is, whatever the scheme is, uh, if you accept a British passport, you'll be okay as a London. But the reason for getting here is because when push came to shove during the course of argument, and the point was repeatedly put to Ms. Kaufman along the lines of, well, how could, how could it be altered? How could it be, what, would, what would be good no, enough no, to remove? We, we got into criminal offence only. And the difficulty, the positive difficulty with that, now you see how the legislation has developed and what its true relationship is to the directive. The positive difficulty with that is that you, you run the risk, as it were, of not being able to do that which the directive positively requires, which is in effect to keep under review your dissuasive domestic system and pass legislation if the thing you do first it doesn't appear to be working properly or as well as it should be. And so you have the move initially to create a broader criminal offence and then you have the move eight years later to introduce a scheme of civil penalties. And that simply couldn't be done on an early friend's case because the moment you introduce the civil penalty and the advice and the guidance and the codes and all that, she said, well, where's the incentive? Which wouldn't be there if you just had this narrow criminal offence. But that's, uh, that's, the consequences are grave because the state then can't do something evidently intended by EU policy and indeed by, uh, by parliamentary policy. So that's what we say about that. Then uh, turning briefly to the evidence we say, as you know, that the evidence does not bear out any finding that landlords, in fact, are discriminating, and that this can properly be said to be caused by the Act. And, of course, in principle, my friend took you to DH and what it had to say about the evidence that would be needed. In principle, of course, evidence is needed to establish discrimination, and there's no doubt some flexibility about the nature of that evidence, having regard to the degrees of difficulty in getting it. But that provides no warrant for unjustified inferences or unsound or doubtful evidence. And indeed, it might be thought that the seriousness of the issue with which my learned friend was, uh, which my learned friend was concerned to emphasise, uh, tends precisely in favour of the evidential base needing to be critically examined. Uh, I made the points that I made about the evidence in opening. I'm not going to repeat them. Uh, I simply uh, uh, note as a general matter that my learning friend Ms. Kaufman spent uh, plenty of time on some of the smaller points but didn't truly answer or address or grapple with, and indeed in large part neither did the judge, the specific four criticisms and concerns uh, that I raised in opening, especially about the inferences properly to be drawn from the mystery shopping evidence even on uh, its face and specifically about the inference about homelessness and serious delays drawn by uh, the judge in his judgment. But on the fundamental problem with the claim uh, that I've uh, alerted to uh, the court to or uh, made submissions about already, we respectfully submit that that fundamental problem, landlords disobeying the law, infects this aspect also. I make two points only about that in the context of the evidence. There is here no statistical evidence establishing a difference of treatment. I put it that way deliberately because one compares and contrasts the position in, for example, DH, where there were hard numbers of Roma children in special schools, no debate about it, and no coherent reason for the extraordinarily high number of Roma children being placed in the special educational system. Here, by contrast, you have something, if I know to use a non-technical term, much fluffier. You have focus on surveys about future intentions and future actions. The questionnaires are all about the future intentions of landlords. And, of course, in relation to that sort of evidence, that sort of questionnaire, that sort of question, nothing flows for landlords from mere statements made in response to those sorts of surveys as opposed to action. They don't have to confront illegality. They just say, well, you know, we'd rather prefer this. Uh, uh, there's no attempt in that questioning, is perhaps the broader point, to understand or explain uh, uh, as part of that surveying process the law, what the law provides, what the codes provide in simple terms, especially 
that there is no real risk of sanction for landlords if they do comply with the rules in the code, and if they do the thing that is suggested in the question by operating a practice of preparing British passports that they would be breaking the law. If one stands back for it and says, well, how do you design a truly fair question which genuinely puts landlords in the place where they do understand the consequences and they do understand the nature of the legislation, both of which have to be assumed for the analysis that we know, the question would read something like this. Would you be prepared to act in a way that amounts to unlawful discrimination and exposes you to claims in the county court in circumstances in which there is a clear, ready way of avoiding both that outcome and any real risk of sanction. But all that does is to build in, my Lord smiles because it's put in a deliberately semi-contentious way, but all that does is to build in the premise that landlords truly understand the law. The law. Yeah, that's, that's, what, that's your point. That's my point. So that's the first answer. Yeah. The second answer is the one I've given repeatedly, which is that it's never rational, logical or acceptable to do that to break the law. So the complete and short answer to suggestions on the evidence that landlords would in fact disobey the law, that's truly what the evidence serves, is that they were, if they were to do, to do so, and it's a big if, for reasons I gave earlier, that would be unacceptable. And more importantly, the Act is not causing that. The Act does not cause unlawful action by landlords. If they're acting in a discriminatory way, they are choosing to do so in the face of a clear legal prohibition that, that the law assumes they've informed themselves about. So that's what we say about the evidence. So far as the issues of discrimination, are we in discrimination and state responsibility and all of that is concerned, before I come to end it, just focusing briefly on uh, discrimination and, and responsibility. The points I make in reply are these. Uh, I need, and I'm sure the court will need, no persuasion that Articles 2, 3, 4 contain positive obligations flowing from the obligation in Article 1 to secure <coughs> the rights and freedoms and the Convention to everyone within the jurisdiction. Those positive obligations under 2, 3 and 4 are acknowledged, they are defined, they are limited, they've been hammered out in the case law, and all of the cases that uh, my learned friend cited on this front uh, are, are Articles 3 and 4 cases we note, apart from MC, which I'll come to in a second. But the obligations under 2, 3 and 4, you remember 4 is about servitude and so on, and it's normally relied on in cases like rants have to do with uh, uh, protection against trafficking and matters of that kind. But all of those contain the same basic structure. They are all absolute obligations, so you need Article 1 to get the secure in, and they all have the same case law. It started, as you will recall, in um, a, a case which I suspect nowadays I would not have won on the facts but lost on the principles, Osman and the United Kingdom. That's where those principles started being hammered out and they're well established. They are sometimes uh, to, have, to take operational steps to protect a member of the public, but that's tolerably rare from actions by another member of the public. That's the real and immediate risk. You'll be very well aware of all that case law. But secondly, and more significantly for present purposes, a structural obligation or a systemic obligation, if you will, to have in place laws that effectively penalise that sort of ill treatment, whether it's killing or Article 3 ill treatment by one private citizen against another or action contrary to Article 4 C. Rancet. All they've done is they've expanded those out for entirely ob obvious reasons because all those articles are set up in the same way. But that's a structural obligation about the existence of the relevant domestic law to protect that basic right not to be subjected, for example, to ill treatment or not to be unlawfully killed and to have efficient police investigations that surround that to make it an effective law. And, and we're simply not dealing with anything like that here. No, but as... Uh, as Calvin and Mr Westgate point out, I mean, the language of Article 14 is of itself mandatory. It is. You've got a double secure in there, ultimately. It, Article 14 refers to secure and Article 1 refers to secure. Yeah. So you've got a... If there is any analogy, as it were, with that, it would be 
it, it would chime in the systemic obligation <coughs> that exists three and four, which is to have laws that protect against discrimination. What do we have? We have the Equalities Act, 2010, with all the support that is provided in the Equality Act 2006 that I showed you this morning. X on the passport, keep coming back to that case, involve that, uh, the sort of case where those were an issue. There was a debate around whether it made any difference, whether it's positive or negative, but of course sometimes there are, inherent in the notion of respect, uh, positive obligations on a state to take those sort of protective me mechanisms. But as I say, uh, one needs to be very careful about analogizing. Firstly, for the reason I've just given, which is that if you analogize from those sorts of obligations, uh, the limit of any obligation that exists under those positive obligations is a, an obligation to pass law to provide protection so that the right or freedom guaranteed in absolute terms can work. And here we have the discrimination legislation. But secondly, we are here dealing with discrimination. I entirely agree with my Lord Lord Justice Davis. We're dealing with discrimination. But what that leads to is that you have the case law under the discrimination provision, which has developed its own principles and rules over time about the limit of that protection. And all of the cases to date, we respectfully submit, have involved direct discrimination by the state, where you pass a piece of legislation that says uh, 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 black people should be treated differently from white people, or men should be treated differently from women, or whatever it may or be. Like DH itself. Like DH itself, direct discrimination, or indirect discrimination. All those social security cases. You set up a system of housing benefits and exemptions and all the rest of it, and that disproportionately impacts women, often single women with children, but women over men. It's the legislation itself which creates the indirect discrimination. And it is that form of discrimination which was only recently recognised in Strasbourg. Do you remember I took you in opening to the decision of uh, Lord Justice Elias analysing DH, saying for the first time they recognised the possibility of indirect discrimination in DH. But the reason for emphasising that is because... Which, which, one category, which category would you say the... Uh, the Roma, the, airport, the airports case falls within. The airport's more like direct. More like you say it's this more more like direct. It's an instruction like from the state to go and target yeah. the Roma. In people. effect, you, uh, even though it wasn't intended to be discriminatory, it was just simply inherent in the whole thing. Exactly. So. Like DH. It doesn't terribly matter because, for present purposes, yeah. I'm simply identifying <coughs> what the Strasbourg Court has recognised direct discrimination by the state or indirect discrimination, that kind. Now, here, by contrast, and it's very important that this discrimination and responsibility question is answered by reference to what we actually are dealing with. Here, by contrast, the state has legislated. It's done so to fulfil a perfectly acceptable and indeed uncontested public interest in a way that is accepted to be proportionate and justified against those in effect without leave to remain. That legislation neither directly discriminates nor indirectly discriminates. On the contrary, it mandates a series of steps to deal with the possibility that there may be a risk of landlords behaving in a discriminatory way. And it provides specific practical mechanisms for trying to deal with said risk. And alongside that bespoke legislation, if you will, is legislation emphasised in our 2014 Act, but is legislation which prohibits expressly discrimination of any kind, direct or indirect, including specifically a provision so precluding, Section 33 of the Equalities Act 2010, in relation to housing. Yet despite that is the premise for this discrimination analysis, when you're trying to set the scene to see how close or far away you are, despite that is the claim private persons are choosing to act in breach of that law despite the prohibition. And the question, therefore, is whether that situation involves discrimination by the legislature in making the primary legislation. And I submit that there is nothing remotely approaching that in any of the case law. And I also submit that this part of the analysis also comes back to the central and fundamental flaw in the claim.
which is that there's no proper basis for any such finding. No one disputes that if the legislation and its scheme is followed, no discrimination is permitted or should occur. So <coughs> Parliament would have to be re-engaged on the basis that some actors are disobeying the law. And that is not the principle we submit. The principle... Well, I, I imagine you'd say, I, mean, I think it was said on behalf of the respondents, or at least one of them, that um, in effect the state has enlisted landlords as its agents or delegates to achieve the overall objective of the legislation, which is that people without lawful right to reside here can't get residences. I imagine you would say, well, if that be right, these are agents who are spe specifically not authorised to, 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 to um, discriminate. Exactly, if that is right. One doesn't want to push the agency no. delegation point too far. And my and I don't think the defendants didn't seek to no. do that. But, but uh, that's the answer. But that would be your answer. I agree. I, I, have a, I have a more fundamental answer, which is that, or, or, or a more fundamental consequence of the submissions I've just made, which is that if the case is being put as it is, on the basis that you get into discrimination so as to be able to attack the legislation on the basis that it is the legislation which causes, underline, the discrimination. We simply don't accept that. The, the, the principle from the Strasbourg case law is not, and there's nothing remotely approaching this, is not causation in the sense that a piece of legislation exists and so that anything discriminatory done under it is attributable to the act or to the state. The state has an extant legal prohibition reinforced by the practical steps set up in the bespoke primary legislation. And it's simply not causation in our situation, on our specific facts, it's not causation that is or should be recognised either by the European Court of Human Rights or domestically for the very simple reason that it involves at base an affront to the rule of law. So that's what we say about discrimination and causation and responsibility. Uh, ambit, very briefly. Ambit involves, as you've seen from the case law, a, 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 a miasma of different <laughs> broad or less broad language. You can say it's generous, you can say there are no limits, you can say you don't need an interference, but the rest of it is miasma. And uh, 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 um, uh, I respectfully suggested in opening, and I maintain the submission, that if you get to a place in your analysis where you say, and I see with respect some uh, 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 logical and coherent force to the way, in, which in particular Mr Westgate put, put, put the case, which is to say, well, where's the difference of principle between a positive and negative? Sometimes it's jolly difficult to analyse the two and you can yeah. go at it. But my plea to the court it, is that when you're doing the ambit analysis, you do what I've just described in relation to responsibility and causation and all of that, and you actually analyse what is involved. You'll remember in the opening submissions I made, I suggested that if you got to this case, this part, in your analysis of ambit, the test of link, if that's the broad concept one wants to use, and you can put any adjective you want in front of it. If you're looking at link, how do you test that is really the principal game that is in play. And the answer to that is we sub submit by focusing at least and perhaps primarily on two things. Firstly, legislation as the cause of the discrimination. And I've made my submissions on that aspect and I don't repeat them. But in the context of the ambit debate, that submission becomes you are not put in the precarious position, if one takes that language from the case my, my law was in, I can't remember if it was M or H or remember the case in which you were with Lord Justice Underhill and the Master of the Rolls. If you say precarious position is, yeah, if you say precarious position is, the, is what you're looking at, you are not put in the precarious position by the legislation in any sense in which the law can or should probably recognise that. And that's because the landlords are acting unlawfully if they discriminate for no good reason. So the first limb of the test to test link, if you will, that I was uh, submitting was uh, uh, something which we would recommend to the court, was the legislation as the cause of it. And secondly, <coughs> evidence of impact. 
And again, I've made my submissions on all the evidence and truly what the evidence does or doesn't on show. On the issue of ambit, do you agree with Ms. Kaufman's submission that when I think the test one runs through, one has to look at see whether the facts bring the case within the ambit? Yeah. Uh, so one has to look at the facts. Yeah. And one of Ms. Kaufman's points is, well, one of the facts here, which is relevant context to deciding ambit, is the objective of the legislation, which is to make it impossible for a person who has no legal right of residence here to get a home. And would you agree that that is actually relevant context for deciding, not necessarily conclusive, but relevant context for deciding the issue of ambit? My Lord, I have well, I shouldn't focus solely on the person potentially going to be discriminated against, which is the subject matter of this dispute. But look that's, where I have a, that's where I have a little difficulty, because there is you, a... You there, do dispute that. I do, because right. there is a disconnect, I submit, then, between the discriminated against group and all the accidental nature of it, and the perfectly acceptable and justifiable, even on her case, scheme which, which targets the other lot. Now, if the, but, but if, which is discriminatory, but just which is discriminatory, but just five, so, yeah. exactly so. So you create that logical disconnect. So you can cram yourself into ambit. It only becomes interesting if you can't cram yourself into ambit for the other group, for the group with leave to remain. So you need then to rely <coughs> on those. But my my submission is that that is not an acceptable way of looking at it because it does create that logical disconnect. Certainly, it would be. A, well, I don't think she said. She didn't see to argue that's the conclusive point, but she no. said it's part of the context which should be borne in mind in deciding the issue of ambit. Do you dispute that? My Lord, I do. You do? Uh, no. Because I say your, your strict focus should be on the discriminated no. against group. No. All right. And that's the question. But, 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 but I've made my submissions. Those are the two tests. If you get to link and you can carve your way through all the language and the impenetrable um, uh, uh, ways in which the test is actually put. But you are, if you start from the premise of going through all the points I made when I was dealing with causation, state has legislated, legislation itself neither directly nor indirectly discriminates, mandates a series of steps to deal with the risk. Alongside that legislation is the EU <coughs> 2010. Despite that, people are choosing to break it when there's no good reason. That's your starting point for ambit, and that feeds into the analysis. That's the centre point of the analysis, working out whether there truly is a link both which is sufficiently close, or perhaps more importantly, because it goes to the base point of principle, there is a link which the law should recognise, given the points about landlords acting in that way. And we are miles away, we respectfully submit, from legislation, if you approach it in that way, from legislation or state action creating an impact on Article 8 rights of the kind that has been considered in, for example, cases like Sidibras, which was one of the negative modality, if one wants to use it, that, that, that was of interest, if that was the dichotomy that was interesting to the court. But we're miles away from that. I mean, in Sidibras, they were, the relevant KGB officers were precluded from any form of employment at all. But just, just so, 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 I this. Are you arguing for a principled difference between positive modalities and negative modalities. Well, my lord, I, I, I maintain clear. that submission. There is that sub, there is that in the case law, but my I, you, I, point, you can say that yeah. empirically, yeah. the cases that go in the favour of substance, as it happens, have all been positive modality yeah. cases. But are you arguing for a principal distinction? Um, and if so, on what conceptual basis? Well, my lord, I think for the purpose of this reply, I, I, I will be I will be <coughs> content to accept that there could be, in principle, some cases in which negative modality was in play, which could bring you within the ambit. So I think the answer to my lord's question is no. I don't maintain that. So I acknowledge there could be, but given the imbalance, but what of you're the in case, effect we'll saying be is very careful. Once it's negative modality, you're at least at orange light territory. You're in orange light territory, and start from the right place. Start from the place in which you're actually analysing the situation you're dealing with. That was the reason for emphasising, and the case that's closest to it is, 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 is the Sidibras case, but we're a long, long way away from that. Are you really in case where, in a, in a situation here, where it can truly be said the legislation is, dealing, is doing this? And we're also, I respectfully submit, a long way away from evidence that there is anything approaching 
homelessness or the seriousness of impact. I don't accept that the evidence at its height demonstrates that or supports any such inference. And again, I dealt with that in opening. I, I fully appreciate that uh, 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 my learned friend Ms Kaufman's case is now, well, I don't need homelessness, but the judge was jolly interested in homelessness for the purpose of ambit and all of the arguments surrounding that. And I've made my do, do you accept that she doesn't need homelessness? Obviously, it helps her if she has homelessness, but do you accept that she doesn't need it? Well, m m m my Lord, I think that's a, that's a much more difficult question to give a yes-no answer to. The second of my criteria against which you judge sufficiency of link was impact. A and so, obviously, that implies that the more serious the impact as actually established, well, obviously you the more likely it is. the judge's reasoning, you could say it was vitiated by what you say is the wrong inference. About homelessness. And I, respect, I, I do submit, but on the evidence that you don't get anywhere near discrimination or difference of treatment at all. But if you do, you are a long way down the scale of seriousness. And that does impact. That place where you put it on the scale of seriousness of impact does impact on, on impact in principle. And I make that submission because of all the points I made about the evidence, which I don't repeat, but also because we do respectfully agree with the point that was made by Lord Justice Hickenbottom about how the statistical evidence works at its highest. And there was no indication of the judge going anywhere like down this route to analyse seriousness. And it is, it is right to say, as I think my learned friend ultimately accepted, it's right to say that you need to actually look behind what the 25% or 40% figures actually mean. They mean ultimately, that you won't get a negative response in the majority of cases, even if the landlords were to operate the practice which is asserted. And the odds, therefore, of getting it twice or three times running exponentially increase. And for this to work to show homelessness or prolonged delay, you need repeat negative reactions. So you can't just say, well, 40% demonstrates it. It certainly doesn't. It doesn't demonstrate a degree of seriousness because next time around you're likely to get it, much more likely than not to get it, even on those 40% figures. Oh, uh, Mr James, if, if you were clever, which I'm not, um, you, you could work out... The percentage. Yes. You could. I mean, you could. I'm not sure what it is, but that's why I said exponentially, because I'm, I'm, I'm a great deal less clever than you, but, and if but, you can't do it, I can't. But, but you, I mean, I, it, you could do it, as a matter of stats. simple. There wasn't a, yeah, it's a matter of simple mathematics. But, um, but it would be quite interesting to see what, what percentage of people on the basis of the figures, which are either 25% or 40%, that seems to be the range, um, uh, what, what percentage of, of people, for example, uh, who make three attempts um, uh, would still be denied accommodation? Well, the, uh, what, what one can say with absolute confidence is that that number is going to go down and pretty savagely down. Yeah. It's like rolling the dice. <laughs> no, no, quite. Yeah. It's the classic statistical analysis, which I'm incapable of doing on my feet, I'm afraid. But, I, but the bull point is that I respectfully agree, if I may, with the fundamental thrust of my Lord's point, which is you can't just look at the figure and say, there you go. Well, you can't look at the absolute figure. 50,000 people, um, for these purposes, um, is not the proper focus. It's yeah. the proportion. Uh, which are, and, the, of course, the surveys do focus on proportion, which is right. They do. And, I mean, it, 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 when you're doing that analysis, you also need to have a bit of a think about uh, um, quite what you're dealing with in terms of overall market. I mean, a large proportion of the market, I think it's 40% of the market, if the RLA figures you were given is right, a large proportion of the market is, is agent. And there's no suggestion that agent is problematic in any way. I suggest they're doing anything other than properly informing themselves and operating proper practices. And you also need to bear in mind that you're dealing here with those who have LGR or LTE, and many of those will already be making applications from a place where they are already in accommodation. And so we're genuinely there talking about transfer rather than first time. Now again, none of that closes the door to the possibility, but that they are factors to be borne in mind when you're looking at the overall picture, and the, which you should be doing, because this is an attack on the legislation. 
The final point I wanted to make in relation to that, and I'll go briefly to justification if I may, the final point I wanted to make about that is that there is no evidence, I think I'm right in saying, from any single person who is homeless or is said to have been rendered homeless by this. And normally in these sort of cases, you're surrounded by awful looking witness statements, which... And, and then, and then the, 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 that's right, in most, in most cases like this, you have a... Examples. A, 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 examples of people. I've, I've had a terrible time. I tried three times. You I couldn't were asked them to extrapolate. You just got, simply got the, what I described, I hope not impertinently, as the fluffier um, exercise of service. Yeah, so again, in the real world, it's perhaps not difficult to understand why evidence of that kind is quite difficult to get. Well, maybe so, my lord, but, but, but there have been... And possibly that... Possibly, you want to say perhaps one or two people have run the EHRC, perhaps, but uh, in the real world. Well, I'm not sure. These organisations, to their credit, in almost every bit of litigation I've ever done involving or against any of them, to their credit. You should have hard examples. They certainly do. And they make the cases difficult because they are genuinely hard cases that are created by the relevant scheme. You have nothing of that kind here. And, and, and of course, we'll do the note that you've asked for. Yes. But the immediate reaction, reaction from, from behind me, you may not be surprised to hear, particularly given the position taken by the Secretary of State on the evidence and the nature of the evidence in any event, even at its height, is that they would have expected to see these sorts of cases flowing through the pipeline. No indication of that either. Does the group not know effectively? Anyway, justification, if I may, <coughs> as the final significant topic. Can I start with the question of principle, applying the questions of principle in relation to justification? And my note at the outset that there is no dispute, there was no dispute in the submissions that were made, that when you're dealing with indirect discrimination, and a fortiori when you're dealing with the situation we have here, which is at one remove even from indirect discrimination, there's no dispute that if that's the nature <coughs> of the claim, it is the measure itself which has to be justified. And you'll remember I took you to, I don't invite you to go back to it, SG, bundle 2, tab 25, para 189, Baroness Hale, for that purpose. So that's to be noted. So far as... Uh, M the S SG case. SG, I gave you that yes, you reference in opening, if you recall. So far as the manifesto without reasonable foundation test is concerned, uh, the submissions we briefly make about that are these. Firstly, the courts have a role and are indeed guardians of the rights not to be discriminated against and all the other rights in the ECHR, as no one disputes. But the test of manifesto without reasonable foundation is not about that accepted role that the courts have. It is rather about the principled and constitutionally appropriate role that the courts adopt in performing that scrutinisation role. And if you just go very briefly back to DA, if you would, in the uh, judgment of Lord Wilson, bundle 2, tab 43, I submit that that distinction is precisely why Lord Wilson structured paragraph 56 as he did. I say that because if you look at paragraph 56, he starts with the bit that my learned friend took you to, saying it's all for the courts to protect against discrimination. So it is, entirely uncontentious. But then within the same paragraph, Lord Wilson goes correctly and directly to the judgment of Lord Reed in the first benefit case, which was SG, paragraphs 92 and 93, and then on to paragraph 57. So he's acknowledging that it's for the courts to do the role and then saying, but within that role, the principled approach properly and constitutionally has to be the one set up by Lord Reed, which was the passage I took you to in opening. That's the first point. Second point is that manifestly without reasonable foundation is the test. And as DA decides, it applies at all stages of the justification analysis. So it's reverted back from the Welsh case. It's, 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 it's a bit rum, because once you're at the level of justification, it is for the Secretary of State to establish. Yeah? 
Yeah. It doesn't sit of itself very well with manifestly without reasonable foundation. But what do you make about the point that the authorities on this have always been directed to what are described as socio-economic cases, where public expenditure is involved? And that's the point that Ms. Kaufman made. What do you say about that? Uh, uh, and Lord Justice Leggett, in the Court of Appeal case, emphasised in the socio-economic field. Yeah. My Lord, I, I respectfully submit that there's a, there's a clear answer to that, which is that it, it doesn't simply apply, which was in truth the way it was put, to expenditure of state resources. The repeated descriptions and analysis of the rationale for the principle, and I took you through them all in opening, make it clear that it applies in effect to those judgments that Parliament is particularly well placed and constitutionally positioned to make. For example a major piece of macro, social or economic legislation. And the reason for the principle, the reason for the breadth of discretion afforded to the legislature derives, and this has been subject of repeated analysis in the Supreme Court and in this court, it derives from the constitutional setup. Is Parliament the better place, person, place body to deal with that? And so that's why in relation to that principle, all of the case law, Lord Carlyle, SG, all the benefit caps cases, all of that, all in the Supreme Court, they effectively identify two features. It's some, Lord Sumption and Bank Mellat as well is as good as anywhere to go for the basics of it. They identify two features that determine the breadth of the margin, to use the old-fashioned term. One of them is, is institutional competence. Which body is better placed to make the judgment about whether this is a good, worthwhile scheme? and all the judgments that go within that. Is it Parliament or is it the courts? And <coughs> second, secondly, the constitutional appropriateness of it being Parliament rather than the courts that makes those judgments. That's paradigmatically from cases like Raymond, which my Lord will, I'm sure, recall, which had the postscript from Lord Hoffman at the end of it saying 9-11 stands as a salutary reminder that sometimes things are best left to Parliament because they are electorally accountable. But that's the constitutional side. And both of those themes come through in the analysis of how broad should the margin be in Lord Sumption's, <coughs> Lord Sumption's judgment in Bank Mellat. But the reason for going back to those basic rationale is to illustrate that it isn't determined and limited by simply saying expenditure of state resources, because those two factors will justify a broad margin in a broader range of circumstances than that. And that's why traditionally it's been put in the way I think my Lord put it to me when you were asking me that question, which is macro, socio-economic type legislation. And here we're paradigmatically in that territory. This is a major piece of social legislation which is designed to alter behaviours and to serve the greater social good of enforcing immigration law. And for good measure, it also has strong elements of expenditure in it and economic aspects in it anyway. <coughs> So for all of those reasons, we don't accept in principle that it's limited. Well, of course, well, well, we must remember, of course, the courts are so familiar with appraising proportionality for itself, but that's almost always when one's appraising the act of the executive. It is. Uh, um, uh, but here, of course, uh, obviously we must bear in mind here, we're, we're appraising a measure of the legislature. You uh, are. And you are, and that was the factor I was going to go to next, because particularly important factors in determining how wide it should be, how, 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 even perhaps within that test, are those factors set out by Lord Justice Leggett and C, which you looked at yesterday in some detail. Do you remember in C, Bundle 2, Tab 46, it's particularly paragraphs 91 to 93. And uh, you will recall that central to that, one of those, or the second of the factors, I think, was precisely the point my Lord has put to me. You get much more leeway if it's primary legislation, you then get much more leeway than if it was just an executive decision if it's secondary legislation, and you get more leeway if it's affirmative resolution rather than negative resolution, because there's greater parliamentary scrutiny. Uh, and so adopting the language, for this purpose, if I may, of intensity of review, mm. if I may just as a shorthand in this context, should we not bear in mind here that what is the subject matter of this dispute is discrimination on the grounds of ethnicity or nationality? Should we not bear that in mind? My Lord, you can bear that in mind, but you need to be a bit careful in doing 
I know that was one of the factors referred to by Lord Justice Leggett at paragraph 91, but that was part of the reason for taking you back to the bedroom tax case and Lord Toulson's judgment, if you will recall that. Do you remember we went there and we went there because ultimately Lord Toulson said, I agree with and approve MWRF as the test on the basis of the reasoning effectively of Lady Hale in Humphreys. And do you remember there was a long quote from Humphreys that I showed you? Yes. And the final paragraph of that quote from Humphreys in Lady Hale's judgment, as you will recall, and it might be thought strongly against her better instincts, said effectively, even when you are dealing with something as suspect as sex discrimination, you still do MWRF. And that was the proposition that was agreed to by the unanimous Supreme Court in, or the um, majority, I think, of the Supreme Court on the merits of the argument uh, in, um, in MA, I think the case was. It was MA, wasn't it? Um, so, so that's my answer there. You need to be a bit careful of Para 91 for that reason. But 92 and 93, which were all about which body within the Constitution is making these decisions, it's primary legislation here, applies with knobs on here because we're dealing plainly with primary legislation. I think in C it was secondary legislation made by affirmative resolution uh, procedure. But, but also uh, scrutiny, which was the factor in paragraph 93. Can I then turn to application of that test here? First point is the one I've just made, but just to emphasise it, primary legislative judgments. But I would add, with the additional scrutiny elements enhancing all of this and MWRF of the secondary legislation, which the, co which the primary required, and the codes and the review of the codes, which again, the primary legislation required. Secondly, the measure itself, that's the test, 189 of Lady Hale, the measure itself is the legislation designed to dissuade those without LTR. And it's accepted that the legislation and that target are justified. And that's unsurprising given the directive and given in any event the exercise of parliamentary judgment. But that's accepted. Thirdly, it's also a feature of the legislative scheme that Parliament has chosen to enact not merely that it sits alongside the pre-existing legislative protections in the EA 2010, but that active positive steps are required in that legislation to protect against any residual risk that there might be a temptation on down doors to discriminate. And that's a perfectly acceptable legislative judgment and indeed a, a thoroughly laudable one. Fourthly, the concerns about the possibility of that incidental and unintended discrimination was, as accepted and asserted by Ms. Kaufman, uh, uh, the stuff of debate and was considered by Parliament and was the stuff of all the pre-legislative scrutiny and consultations that are referred to in Mr. Asmat's statement. And they no doubt led to the shape of the legislation including specifically and in particular section 33 of the 2014 Act with its requirement for a discrimination code. And so we submit the scrutiny element by Lord Justice Leggett at paragraph 93 is more than satisfied. Fifthly, that legislative scheme involves a judgment about the legal prohibitions in place and what was needed by way of practical guidance to reinforce them. But underpinning <coughs> all of that is the fundamental legislative judgment that, that landlords, if they followed the procedures and processes that the legislation prescribed, would obey the law. And it's accepted that if they follow the code and the legislative scheme, they will do so. And at the level of justification, which is why I say all roads tend to come back to this same point, at the level of justification, it cannot possibly be asserted 
that Parliament should have proceeded on the basis that landlords would not do so. Parliament makes laws on the fundamental constitutional premise that laws will be obeyed. So my learned friend says, well, that's all fine and dandy. It might, I suppose you might accept, have been okay on day one, but things have moved on. What about evaluation? And my submission is that the legislation is either compatible or it isn't. You can't drift in and out of compatibility depending upon the actions of private individuals. Suppose six months... You accepted at an earlier stage in your address this morning that uh, it was appropriate to look at the effectiveness of the measure in question. <coughs> now, I'm not quite clear at this stage. Argument. Are you saying it's logically irrelevant? My Lord, I, I accept you, you can look at what happens in practice, uh, but uh, uh, the legislation has to be compatible or not. And it has to be compatible or not on day one, I respectfully submit. So what then on this argument is the relevance, if any, of what subsequent evidence may or may not show? Well, it may lead to a position where a state is in a state of incompatibility, I suppose. But we're, we're, we're not anywhere close to that, that, that place. And I do submit that before you even got remotely there, you would need to be very, very careful indeed, because... Um, uh, 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 because this is a, an exercise which focuses on the nature of the legislation and because there is a real principal difficulty with an Act of Parliament drifting in and out of compatibility. I see that. and You would say, even if you do look at what subsequently happened, it doesn't get the respondents home. I mean, you would say that. But it's not quite clear uh, whether the court, at this level of the argument, is entitled to have regard to what is said to have occurred in practice as a result of the legislation, or whether it is, in fact, not even something which is capable of being admissible. I'm not quite clear what your answer is. No, my Lord, can I, can I, can I formulate it and see? My, my, I, I think the submission, the logic of the submission I've just made is that you need to judge it on day one. And so it's in principle irrelevant. But secondly and alternatively, even if it isn't, you need to be extraordinarily careful, not least because of the principal difficulty of an act drifting in and out of compatibility. Well, but then you get the, the line of thinking, I suppose, and by the way, they say it's still not possible to judge the consequences of the French Revolution. When do you take your appraisal? Well, my lord, there is no... That, that's your point about like drifting in and out. It, 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 it is. And that's, that leads to the principal difficulty of, of adopting that approach. I mean, normally under domestic law, at least, it would be for Parliament to decide when and if the evidence had got it's to a state. somewhat counterintuitive that... Um, I'm not talking about this case, but supposing you have a measure which has turned out to have the most disastrous consequences in practice, which were not invented, it seems bit counterintuitive that you just say, too bad, we ignore it. My, my Lord, it does, and it may, it may, I suspect, the resolution of that may come back to whether or not it truly infects the legislation as legislation in that sort of situation, and if it does lead to satisfaction of those tests, and there are difficult issues to use those. It's a general principle, certainly, in tort law, that you don't speculate as to the future if you know the facts at the time. I mean, it's, difficult. it's a difficult question for precisely the reason you've given. One can posit a series of extreme situations yeah. in which it might feel awkward. But there's real awkwardness the other side of the argument. Yes. That's the difficulty. Yes. Because otherwise, I think the court has put on a couple of occasions yes. now, what would happen if, I don't know, suppose there were five or ten real big landlord bust-ups in the county court, yeah. supported or otherwise by EHRC. Yeah, and they're given huge publicity and they that succeeded. May radically change and all of a sudden it radically changed it. Would it be incompatible on day three and not incompatible on day five? Right. There's a principal difficulty with that. But, but th th this is, uh, I haven't quite worked out how, but this, this, this certainly um, links in with your focus in terms of compatibility on capability yeah. of, of the legislation um, to conform to conform and, and, it, and as, it, as its capability um, that, that does fit in with this aspect of, of your submission it does.
it does and so does the front my keep going back to the fundamental flaw because ultimately when you start down that road of analysis well, that's you, the same that's the, it's the same sort of point but you say well, why, why, why are we in trouble we're in trouble because the landlords are disobeying the law when they don't need to if the discrimination is made out well, I wanted to make one final reference to one final document which is in your little clip of three which is a document that looks like that Yes. And this is the ministerial statement, uh, I think done pretty shortly after, if not on the day of the handing down. You've given, you've given copies of all I've given copies of all those. I have to my, I hope they've got them. Um, Whereabouts, in the, should we put this in supplemental bundle then? Or somewhere? My lord, if you will, supplemental bundle. Yeah. I don't know where you're going to put the other two on. Right. Anyway, yes, what, what we should but, do but the reason I wanted to go to this is to indicate that uh, there is, in fact, a, a, a further evaluation going on anyway. If you look at the passage about two paragraphs below the second hole punch, as my right on friend, the Home Secretary, do you have that paragraph? <coughs> so I just like to read that paragraph and the, and the penultimate paragraph. Well, that's pretty vague. We are looking at options for further evaluation. That's classic civil service language, isn't it? Well, we're looking at further, further, further mechanisms to monitor the operation of the scheme to we provide look, ongoing assurance. Look to develop. That's not ongoing evaluation. It's just say we're thinking about evaluating. Look at the, look at the penultimate paragraph before I'm castigated too hard. <laughs> this is a consultative panel. It seems to come in and out of operation depending on external pressure rather than any sort of internal. Well, my lord, I, I simply introduced this, not by way of new evidence, but just to make clear that when it is said everyone has set their face against doing a further evaluation, that is That's not that, that, that overstates the position. That's not fact yet. But uh, I thought there was a, an indication that there would be an evaluation after two years. Two, two years after full implementation. Yeah, I think that was the, that was that was the debate in correspondence. But the reality is the ambiguity. Exactly. But, that, but 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 this is ongoing. As I understand it, there have been various shenanigans and various bits of correspondence, both with EHRC and JCWI about the extent to which they're prepared or not to assist with this exercise. But what do you say about Mr Armstrong's objections? Objections to? Well, for example, going ahead, rolling out with a further impact assessment and evaluation. Well, oh, that's the subject of the Declaration of Irrationality. Yes, yes. But which I, I, can come to, I can come to you directly now, because that's, that's, that's the last topic. Right, all right. This goes to this. All I wanted to say about that side of things all right. is that I maintain the position that it's pointless in my language because everyone is going to have to look at and will look at the judgment of this court. That's the, that's the critical feature. And no decision had been made, and the litigation was ongoing, and everything had been paused in the meantime. And we debated that in opening, so I don't go back to it. The evidential position is set out in Mr. Asmat's statement. If you go back to that in the supplemental bundle, starting at page 85, the relevant paragraphs are 80 to 83 on page 112. Of, of the bundle. Yeah. Can I just invite you to take that up? So, so sorry, which page? Page 112. Oh, that's okay. And it's really paragraphs 80 to 83, effectively saying we haven't made a decision, we're not going to roll it out during the currency of the claim. And look at 81. set their face against any evaluation prior to any decision to roll out is simply inaccurate. But w w wasn't, the, wasn't the point made a, 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 against you on, on paragraph 81 uh, that although um, this suggests an updated policy equality statement uh, on the basis of relevant evidence, there won't be any more relevant evidence because you haven't looked for it. You haven't done any evaluation, so there's no more evidence to go in. So any evaluation will simply be on uh, the same bracket incomplete well, I'm not sure that's a fair reading of 81. Look at the second sentence. We set out any relevant evidence, including any apparent discrimination and so on. And, and, and we know from the ministerial statement that they're, they're doing or considering, or however you want to put it, 
that evaluation. I suppose in reality that would include the very evidence in this case. The very evidence in this in case, case and, a, and anything further that, arri uh, that arrives. But the, the, the core point is that a decision has not been made, is the point that's being made to roll out. And before a decision is made, there will have to be lawful processes. That hardly needs to be said, but it's implicit in 81. They will include a public, further updated public equality statement at that stage, and that will either conform with the law or it won't. Is it intended there will be any further consultation process as such? I think, that, was that referred to in the ministerial statement? I'm not sure whether there's going to be a formal further consultation process, but I'm afraid I can't confirm one way or t'other on that, my lord, but I do know that invitations to participate have been made to both EHRC and JCWI in that process. But the core point is that before a decision is taken to roll out, you will have this analysis, and it will either work or it won't work. If a decision were to be taken tomorrow, I don't know, if a decision were to be taken in the future, it would have to be a lawful decision. And if someone wanted to object on the basis that there hadn't been a proper further evaluation or that there hadn't been a proper public equality, uh, equality statement, policy equality statement made or that the PSED and 149 are not being complied with, then that's the time to bring the legal challenge. We simply don't know what the state of evidence is going to be when the decision is made. That's the short point. If, if, if the court were to take the view that what the respondents say is in essence right and that uh, the scheme is incompatible, obviously you say they're wrong. You asked me that in opening. Yeah. And I gave, I hope, a pretty clear answer to that. No, I just want to be clear. Would, would in those circumstances... Would there be any plans, nevertheless, to roll out? I think I gave you the answer, no. <laughs> I hope that's clear enough. Those behind me better be listening. <laughs> but I can see, for the obvious reason that the court will have declared the scheme to be unlawful. Yes, I think I understand. And Parliament would need to think again. Yes. yes. I hope that's clear enough. Just testing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Good. Well, those are my submissions. As we uh, mentioned at this stage, there's no question of this court giving an extemporary judgment, and we would indeed like to take time uh, to consider our decision. Uh, may we say that all three of us thought that all the arguments of counsel, of all counsel, written and oral, were excellent, uh, but as often happens, that uh, sometimes makes the decision even more difficult to decide than easier. But uh, we're very grateful to all counsel. Uh, are there any other points which arise? We'll hand out our judgments in the usual way, you know, the form of typographical corrections, not the argument. And then we'll hand down, and hopefully any matters arising can be dealt with if they can't by agreement. If they can't be, we'll accept written submissions on those points. Well, Anything else arising? Nothing for me, thank you. And thank you, thank you also, all of you, for keeping within your time limits. And we, we will have that note provided to us. Uh, I don't want to set a formal time limit, but uh, is there an indication? Well, my Lord, I'm, I'm, we're happy to impose one on ourselves. We're, we're very happy to provide it within seven days if that's convenient to the court. Well, if you don't, I, I, I won't give a direction as such, but if, if, if counsel could just do that. And I say, what we really do want, if possible, is an agreed note, Absolutely. if possible. Well, hopefully the agreement will be the short part of the seven days. Uh, but can, can you aim for seven days then? Is that, is that including the weekend or not? <laughs> so you, you, you make up your own mind. Seven days inclusion. <laughs> Yes, Ms. Cuffin, um, Lord, I'm so sorry to, to, to just raise one point, just yes. to correct something that, Ms. Uh, that Sir James said about uh, all the Strasbourg jurisprudence. He made the point that there is not one case where um, the legislation, general legislation, outlawed the, the discrimination, and that's actually not correct. So for your Lordship's note, can I just give you the Grislak case, 
which was tab 68, and on page 33 at 6, little Roman numeral 6, this is in part of the dissenting judgments, one of the reasons for the dissent there was precisely because the law provided for the prescription of discrimination on religious grounds in any event. Yes, you did refer to the Gujarat case, yes. yes. You were entitled to the last word. Is there anything you wish to say on that? No? Thank you for reminding me, sir. Well, I'm very sorry. I don't, just on the subject of notes, Sir James raised today the point about the 2006 powers uh, that the, the Commission has. Um, that there are points that the Commission might say about those being theoretical rather than real in terms of the application of the present practical context. If you want a note on that, I'm troubled by that, then I'm happy to provide it. I don't want it, but is it, is it, necessary, <laughs> is it, is it, is it necessary for your argument? No, I'm not sure it is. I'm just asking whether you no, thank you for the offer, but to offer a decline. Thank you very much. Thank you all very much. Cool